start it. Um, it started. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, open infra se infrastructure roundtable session of the uh, data side member meeting day. Um, very happy for you to join us today. My name is Sally Chen, and I'm the project lead of the Implementing Fair Workflows project at DataSite, and I will be your moderator today. Well, uh, as a short introduction, it, uh, we all know that it's important for infra infrastructures to be robust and integrated, and this requires a shared vision and continued collaboration among stakeholders. And today, we're very happy to have uh, speakers from Crossref, ORCID, ROAR, ARDC, and IGSN alongside uh, our uh, Helena at, uh, from DataSite to join us and talk about how infrastructure organizations work together to enable metadata interoperability and seamless integration of services. So we'll kick off this session with short introduction talks from each of the speakers to tell us their uh, approach into interoperability and collaboration on three levels, the strategic level, the engagement level, and the technological level. And at this point, if we have questions that are generally applic applicable uh, from the audience, so we will address them. Uh, and after that, uh, we'll change our perspective and look at how the infrastructure and the services that provide support each stage of the research life cycle. That's what we'll base our curated uh, discussion session on. So first, a little bit of a housekeeping. Uh, please tweet about the open uh, sessions using the hashtag datasite22 and uh, feel free to introduce yourself in chat. Uh, the session will be recorded. It is recorded. I hope you have noticed that uh, in the beginning of the session, this will be recorded and shared publicly uh, together with all the slides that are presented today. And please use the Q&A tool for your questions. So. Um, Today's panelists, we have uh, Patricia Finney, uh, the head of metadata at Crossref, uh, Helena Kuzin, uh, the Co community engagement director here at DataSite, uh, Jens Klump, uh, the vice president of IGSN uh, executive board, and uh, Paloma Marine Aradza, <laughs> sorry for putting your name, apologize, um, the engagement manager at ORCID. Uh, Sean Ross, uh, product manager at the RDC, uh, representing RAID, the uh, research activity identifier, and Amanda French, the technical community manager at ROAR. So without further ado, we will, uh, I will give the floor to Patricia to start uh, the first talk. Um, sure, you can share your screen. All right, thank you. Sharing. Just uh, briefly, just for the brief, I could talk about this stuff for a long time, but <laughs> I'm supposed to keep it brief, so I'll do my best. Um, for those of you, I think most of you are familiar with Crossref, but for those of you who aren't, um, or if you're not as familiar, um, we're a membership organization consisting of publishers, funders, and other organizations that create and impact scholarly communication. Uh, we help our members register metadata records and uh, persistent identifiers, DOIs, uh, for the content grants and other resources that they create. Um, the metadata registered with us is increasingly vast, and we're able to picture a new kind of vision, I think, that's shared across a lot of work organizations for how we want to grow what we collect and what we connect to. Uh, we want to create a rich and reusable open network of relationships connecting research organizations, peoples, things, and actions. Uh, we see it as a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of society. So it's a very grand vision, but I think it's very important. Um, so this idea of what we're calling the research nexus goes beyond the basic idea of just having persistent identifiers for content, uh, objected entities such as journal articles, book chapters, grants, preprints, data, of course, software, statements, dissertations, protocols, affiliations, contributors, and it's an endless list. <laughs> um, all of the, those pieces of metadata all need to be identified 
And that is a very important part of the picture. But what is most important increasingly is how they relate to each other, um, how we can place them in context um, and, and how they combine to create this whole research ecosystem. So we're working with our membership and other organizations to provide richer metadata for a widening set of objects and to make these really granular connections between them. Um, so very briefly, we've begun building this nexus already, mostly with the resources under our control. But to make this vision a reality, we really need to work with other open infrastructure organizations to connect and collaborate. Uh, you know, we already collect ORCID identifiers and ROAR. We've started collecting ROAR identifiers, and we expect that will grow a lot in the future. So how do we plan to do this? Uh, we plan to do this through open metadata, persistent identifiers that span organizations, not just cross-ref identifiers. Uh, we, we are going to work with members of our community like Datacite, ORCID, ROAR, and other organizations like the Initiative for Open Abstracts, um, Initiative for Open Citations, and we also um, are embracing the principles of open scholarly infrastructure, POSI. Um, so just some details on how we do this. We have open APIs. We adopt the standards and best practices put forth by our community. At Crossref staff, we participate in all kinds of working groups and committees on all kinds of levels that shape metadata and even beyond metadata, just um, we have a lot of discussions about how our APIs and infrastructure can communicate with other organizations. Um, we work with invested organizations like PKP and DOAJ to lessen barriers for registering metadata records with us so that we can provide the rich metadata records that other organizations require. And we also internally have a number of working groups and, committee, and committees that welcome participation from invested or organizations. So really it's all about collaboration, how we collaborate technically and you know on a more of a social level. And that's it for me. Thank you. Well thank you, Patricia. That's a very good overview of all of the collaborative efforts. Um next to Helena, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Shelley. I thought uh, with an eye on the clock, I'll just uh, share my screen straight away. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thanks so much for attending this, uh, this session uh, of our member meeting. And also thanks to, uh, to all the other speakers. We're really happy to uh, have you participate uh, and contribute to the member meeting today. Uh, I will provide a very brief introduction uh, to Datasite. I think uh, you will already know some of this. Um, but Datasite is like Crossref, a global nonprofit membership organization. We work with over 2,500 repositories around the world to provide DOIs for data sets and also other research outputs. And how that works, uh, I just wanted to, to demonstrate that with a, with a simple infographic. Um, the building that you see on my slide is a research institution and at research institutions, many different types of research outputs are being generated. But if these just sit on someone's laptop or on an external hard drive, then they don't become part of the research ecosystem. And that's why it's important to think about persistent identifiers and metadata. Because if a persistent identifier is assigned, then the entity becomes part of the research lifecycle. And through the metadata, it's possible to connect the outputs to all the other entities within the research lifecycle. And the metadata makes the output more discoverable so other researchers can find and reuse the output as well. And it makes it easier to track what's happening with the output. And that information now feeds back into the research institution again. Now, our vision at Datasite is connecting research to identify knowledge. And I think that's really relevant to this session today, which is all about these connections uh, between open infrastructures. And so metadata is really key for that. And I think Patricia also referred to that and I wanted to show that on this slide. So if you imagine in the middle, uh, let's say for the purposes of this talk, it's a data set um, in the blue circle and you assign a data site DOI to your data set, then through the related identifier property in the metadata, you can connect your data set to related research outputs. That This can be the software used to analyze the data, but also an article you published about the data. 
you can connect it to yourself as a researcher um, by adding uh, an ORCID ID in the name identifier field. And you can connect it to your organization by adding a ROAR in the affiliation identifier field. And then it's also important to consider the funder of the research. So for that, we have the funding reference property. Now, all these things together, all these connections we're making, that those form a graph. And this is also related to the research nexus that was mentioned. So through the connections in the metadata, we can get this more complete picture of how everything in the research ecosystem is connected and how data sets connect to publications and to software and to researchers and organizations and funders. And very briefly, um, something a bit more practical about uh, current collaborations, because I don't know how much time uh, we'll have uh, later in this session. So I already wanted to mention now some of the things we're working on um, with the other uh, partners that are on the call today. Uh, so with Crossref, uh, we have a service we call Event Data and both Crossref and DataSide contribute information we have about the relationships between Crossref DOIs and DataSide DOIs. ROARs uh, we've integrated into our metadata and also into DataSide comments. With IGSN, and you may have seen the announcement earlier this week, IGSN registration is now available through DataSide services. Uh, with ORCID, we collaborate on auto update where you can um, automatically enable uh, your ORCID records to be updated with outputs with data side DOIs. And with RAID, which is a bit newer, we're currently working on how we integrate that into the metadata. So uh, I will stop there. Thank you, uh, Shelley, and uh, I'll hand over to the next speaker. Thank you, Helena. Next up is Ian. Yeah, so um, Helena gave me a good segue into the next um, presentation on IGSN. And I'll start with an elevator pitch uh, where IGSN is about um, acknowledging that it's difficult to track samples across institutional and system boundaries and unambiguously link them with data and literature. And to solve this problem, IGSN provides a persistent identifier system for physical samples through a globally unique resolvable identifier that's, that is compatible with other persistent identifier systems. IGSN uh, persistent identifiers are already used by major research centers, universities, and government geolo geological surveys, and they are endorsed by scientific publishers. And as Helena just mentioned, IGSNs are now available through DataSite to all DataSite members. So it's one service, one subscription. And what Helena also talked about is this um, cross-linking through the re related identifier element. This is a, one of the um, important features of how IGSN is set up and is what it does. And on this slide, there's an example of a specimen of, in this case, kaolinite and uh, uh, mineral um, that is identified by an IGSN. And then I an optical spectrum was measured on this specimen. And this specimen, this spectrum is then uh, published through, the, in this case, the CSIRO data access portal and identified by a DOI. And this data set of the spectrum is discussed in a publication, which itself is identified by a digital object identifier. So you can see how um, you can now cross reference all these materials and um, move between the, those entities to learn more about them. And um, what Helena also um, already mentioned is that DataSide and IGSN work together in a partnership to provide regis registration for physical samples, to also give guidance on best practices and provide technical solutions. The IGSN organization develops, publishes guidelines on um, information that is displayed on the landing pages and how to populate the data site metadata fields so that they are um, semantically coherent. And the data site samples community manager works with the data site members who want to assign DOIs to physical samples. And for more information, you can go to the data site pages or to igsn.org. 
Thank you. Thank you, Jens. Next up is Paloma. Yes, so it's loading. There we are. So um, most of you probably already know Orchid, uh, but um, as Crossref and DataSite, uh, Orchid is also a non-for-profit organization. And our main mission is uh, to enable all these trustworthy connections between researchers that are going to be always in the middle and their contributions and other activities in the scientific and research ecosystem, such as their affiliations or uh, any other type of action related to innovation. Um, so the main part is that we have people in the middle, researchers, contributors, and then uh, we have all their production and their interactions in this scholarly um, ecosystem. So uh, we have, for example, their publications, their data sets, software, um, ideas they might have or funding they receive. Um, and how can we connect actually all those? Uh, basically through um, infrastructures that communicate with each other. So this uh, context of open infrastructures and taking uh, the power of APIs, of application programming interfaces. So here, for example, we see how the ORCID record might communicate with the institutional repository, with the publisher, or with the funding um, entity, and also how these uh, funding entities, uh, publishers and institutions also communicate uh, with each other. So that using metadata and uh, protocols, they can actually exchange all these uh, data and uh, reuse them and actually contribute to that metadata reusing part. One um, example more closely um, at ORCID. So we work with um, different uh, persistent identifiers for works um, and uh, we continue uh, adding new um, identifiers to that list. One of them um, is DOIs, both from data site and Crossref, and also the corresponding auto update with them. And also we work with organizations identifiers such as ROAR um, and Ringle and others. Uh, but of course, um, it is the prioritization of the inclusion of resolvable PEATs um, as part of the metadata associated with every item that we have, and that we provide those metadata as a public domain under CC0 license as part of our public um, data file so that others can reuse that and also uh, integrate that as part of their um, platforms as well. And when it comes to community and collaboration, uh, we try to uh, keep the community standards and adopt them and also adopt them through this community collaboration. Some examples are the credit taxonomy or the cast right catalog um, of elements and uh, also be in touch with the community through groups such as the Researcher Advisory Council or the Funders Interest Group. And two um, examples in praxis or use cases are, for example, affiliations using ROAR or um, works using the contributor roles. And um, if we pay a bit more attention, then we see that ORCID is connected as well with the corresponding um, DOIs, ROAR, or the contributor roles. And also in the case of affiliations with other identifiers such as ISNI or FUNPREF. And also uh, important is that the source appears there so that we can track as well metadata provenance. And that will be it. Thank you, Paloma. We have Sean uh, talking about Rave coming up next. There, that should uh, hopefully have shared. Um, so um, I'm, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I may uh, uh, give provide just a bit more background because I think RAID is the newest of uh, of, of these identifiers and might be less well known. And I may even um, indulge in making a few comparisons to the other identifiers that have been around for uh, for longer. Um, so first, the Australian Research Data Commons, um, we're a not-for-profit company um, providing national infrastructure in Australia. And our relationship to the RAID is um, essentially that we have, uh, we're in the late stage 
stages of getting an ISO standard for RAIDs, where uh, the ARDC will be the registration authority, establishing policies and guidelines globally for uh, RAIDs, and will also be the Australasian registration agency that uh, operates a service for minting raids, and we envision other um, reg uh, registration agencies um, around the world uh, as well. And essentially, the, the idea behind a raid is that um, most re research takes place um, in the context of something that for lack of a better term, we'll call a project, uh, that there is um, a, an individual or collaborative um, uh, uh, time-limited uh, entity that most uh, uh, research happens in. And what um, uh, what we're doing is providing uh, a PID for research projects and the activities that they undertake. Um, and that consists of a handle um, a service uh, th that provides a unique and persistent identifier and a metadata, a metadata envelope uh, that contains a collection of other persistent identifiers and project information that is found nowhere else. Um, and it can also include uh, named relationships to other raids. So we're expecting, uh, for example, hierarchical uh, use of of, um, of of raids and parent child you know, sub projects or activities undertaken by um, by a project. Um, and we're we're in early early stages uh, now. Um, uh, I've been doing a lot of consultations recently, and uh, it, you know, and we are close to having an early version of the metadata envelope uh, ready, and some other definitions and scope uh, documents that um, uh, I'd be happy to share if anybody's interested. Uh, but our um, design principles behind this are that we are a source of truth for for research projects that allow, for example, organizations. Um, to share information about projects without having to rekey it or having things get out of sync from one uh, one participating organization to the next, um, but that we absolutely do, we don't have any interest in duplicating information that's held elsewhere. The metadata envelope is fairly streamlined, um, and uh, but we do include project information not found uh, anywhere uh, else. Um, and again, it's a relatively uh, um, short list of metadata attributes there. Um, we link the project, the RAID links to particular other entities, but we don't, um, we, we don't want to trot on anyone else's toe. We're not trying to link the other entities to each other. So for example, this would tie a project to funding institution data, uh, data sets uh, that they produce or consume, et cetera. Uh, but we don't try to, uh, for example, um, tie contributors to publications or um, tie any of the um, uh, uh, any of the things in the um, the identifiers or entities in the outside circle here to one uh, to one another. Um, so uh, we always get asked what a project is. I provided kind of a. I don't want to go into too much depth with this, um, but um, um, uh, essentially we're 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 attempting here to not duplicate anything else that others are doing um and so you can see a list of what the project's not and essentially this is the vehicle uh, a project we're defining as the vehicle or enterprise that undertakes um uh, undertakes research and we um, then allow uh, through hierarchical um uh, deployment of raids uh, for you to for, to include uh, uh, sub projects activities etc and we've gotten to the point of modeling this with um from sort of a typical small academic project up through quite large projects that may have three or four levels of hierarchy and 10, 10 to 50 um, entities at each uh, at each level. Uh, and we're really in the outreach and engagement uh, phase right now. We've got an advisory group consisting of um, global experts, including representatives of most of the other PID services, uh, partnerships with early adopters in Australasia who are currently who are using an early version of the RAID service that we're currently rebuilding. Um, and uh, we've got other partnerships with EOSC, um, SURF in the Netherlands, JISC in the UK, um, et cetera, and many of the organizations who are at this um, uh, at, at this webinar now. So um, we are also under uh, undertaking other consultations. So if anyone would like to uh, contact me, I would be happy to uh, talk to you about use cases and requirements. And that's that's RAID. Uh, Thank you very much, Sean. I think it generated a lot of interest in chat and questions for Ray as well, but we'll address them after our last uh, talk by Amanda.
Um, hello all, are you seeing the correct screen? <laughs> uh, no, we're seeing no. your, um, mm. uh, uh, what's it called? The, the speaker, speaker notes. notes, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Always you would think I would be able to manage this. Okay, hang on. Okay. I have too many monitors, really. <laughs> How's that? That works. Perfect. Good. Okay, great. Um, thanks all. Um, Roar has been mentioned in a number of the presentations already, um, beginning with Crossref, uh, which has added support for Roar uh, within the past year. Uh, Datasite itself supports Roar. Um, ORCID supports Roar, so I'm happy to go last and tell you a little bit more about what it is, if you didn't already know. So Roar is the Research Organization Registry. It is a persistent identifier, um, global, community-led um, project for identifying research organizations. Uh, Roar links research outputs to organizations that employ, fund, and publish scholarly researchers. Uh, it's been in existence officially since 2019 and um, has over 102,000 research organizations currently identified. There was a question that came up earlier about ISNI, which is, of course, also a somewhat open, persistent identifier. Um, and ISNI, as I mentioned in the Q&A, has 13 million objects, people, organizations identified, whereas Roar only has 102,000. And uh, oddly enough, that precision, we think, is one of the, the major value propositions of Roar. The primary use case of Roar is to identify researcher affiliations um, with universities that employ them, um, with funders that have funded the research, and um, with publishers that are publishing their research. Um, with ISNI, you, you know, will get identifiers for 18th century painters, um, for barber shops, you know, all kinds of things. So um, the really specific use case for Roar is to identify top level organizations that are connected with research. And as you can see um, here in just a screenshot of the web interface to a Roar record, um, each Roar record does include external, identifi exter external identifiers, including uh, where available identifiers um, for ISNI. Um, this is the actual Roar ID. Um, it's a unique string that is randomly generated uh, with nine characters following the Roar domain. Um, the Roar registry began with seed data from Digital Sciences Grid, uh, which is an identifier system that many systems did use. Um, and in fact, Digital Science was really um, very much engaged in handing over you know, their purpose uh, to Roar, uh, and they were um, very, very much formative in the early days. And so Roar was originally based on seed data from Grid. Um, we've since diverged, and uh, Roar is now the official successor to Grid. So in terms of strategic collaborations and engagement, I actually did want to talk about the extent to which Roar itself really is a strategic collaboration. Um, Roar is not an organization. Uh, it is really primarily supported by three organizations, Datasite, Crossref, and the California Digital Library. Uh, Maria Gould is here from the California Digital Library. She is the Roar project lead and has been for several years. Um, and she is um, a core member of the Roar team, really the lead of the Roar team. Um, I am the technical community manager for Roar, but I am actually employed full time by Crossref. So I am Crossref's contribution to uh, the Roar initiative, Crossref is very much supportive of Roar and um, not just in sort of a technical collaboration, but really, really willing um, to support Roar in all kinds of strategic and outreach ways as well. Um, our technical lead, Liz Krasarnich, um, is actually full-time employed at Datasite. Um, so that's the extent to which Roar itself really is kind of a, I think, a, a poster child in a way for strategic collaborations. Um, so I actually also think if you're if you're interested in reading about the history of Roar, I think that's a kind of a, a fabulous 
object lesson in collaboration as well, because these discussions really began in uh, 2016. So sort of three years of continual collaboration between major players in the scholarly communication space, um, in which, you know, everyone realized that there needed to be an organization identifier and that the existing solutions were not really sufficient, either because they weren't open enough or didn't really properly express the, the necessary use case. So I, if you're interested in looking at um, how ROAR came to be, um, I'd encourage you to go read about that history. ORCID was involved uh, on the steering group that developed the pilot, as I mentioned, digital science uh, helped form ROAR and uh, just plenty and plenty of collaborative workshops specking out what was needed for um, an organizational identifier, which is what ROAR has become. And then currently, too, as well, um, I think Patricia, um, in her presentation, um, gave a great overview of the same kinds of uh, outreach and engagement activities that we involved in. We are involved in. We um, are, you know, continually working with groups like Force 11 and various open access groups to uh, help promote ROAR. Uh, but really, to me, it's, it's it's really been fascinating having joined ROAR relatively recently to see how baked into the day-to-day -day management of ROAR um, collaboration is. So for instance, uh, when we make changes to the registry, um, that is overseen by a, an advisory board that is made up of representatives from the Department of Energy and um, from you know, other organizations all around the world. Um, we have many sustaining supporters that have voted confidence in ROAR um, by helping sustain us financially. Uh, and we have um, community advisory board that um, meets, you know, usually once a month, um, once every couple of months to really help us um, see the way forward. So really just a sort of day-to-day -day management of ROAR um, is continually a collaborative endeavor. Um, we're also uh, one of the things that we're doing, we have lots and lots of, of um, events coming up, things like that, uh, but DataSight and ROAR are putting together, for instance, a best practices workshop for integrating ROAR into repository systems. Um, so we're currently co-organizing that and we'll be announcing that as soon as we can. Technical collaborations. Um, so with ROAR having uh, a really entirely open API, um, that you don't need to register for, you don't need to pay for, which is not true for a lot of other identifier APIs or identifier database, databases. Um, we certainly find sometimes that, you know, in a way collaboration isn't so much necessary because we are just sort of, um, you know, as it were, leaving goods out on the sidewalk for people to just pick up and use as they will. Uh, but that being said, um, we do work quite closely with, for instance, uh, DataSite and Crossref, who of course are you know, um, strategic collaborators, uh, but we have worked quite closely with them to make sure that uh, ROAR can be supported in their APIs. Um, this screenshot is from the data site API um, where you can see uh, ROAR being used as an affiliation identifier. Data site is currently calling for feedback on its new schema and uh, asking for input on, for instance, using ROAR IDs as a uh, unique identifier for publishers. Um, so if you haven't already taken a look at the uh, data site schema proposal for changes, uh, do take a look at that. Um, ROAR has been um, widely adopted by what I think of as meta infrastructure projects. Uh, big list here. So um, anyone who's kind of really interested in tracking something across kind of the global system of scholarly communication has found ROAR really useful. Open Alex, which is the successor to the Microsoft Academic Graph, has um, done a really tremendous um, lot of work mapping affiliations using ROAR in its, um, in its product. And so I'd encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, but uh, we're also seeing a lot of publishers and repositories, individual publishers and repositories, beginning to sort of bake ROAR into their systems and then in many cases send those identifiers to Crossref and DataSite. Um, and that's really what we hope um, we'll see more and more of in the next um, couple of years in particular. Um, so ROAR is most often used to indicate researcher affiliation as it is here. 
But we are also seeing kind of additional use cases for the, for the ROAR identifier, uh, including to indicate who funded research. Um, we, there is already the Crossref funder ID, and discussions have just begun about how to potentially merge the Crossref funder ID with the ROAR ID. So we're just beginning to look at how that's working. Um, and then just, I guess I'll, I'll say finally that, um, uh, you know, ROAR is a completely open project, as I mentioned before. So we provide an open data dump. We have an, an entirely open REST API with no fees and no registration. Um, so we think that that's one of the reasons why people are finding it increasingly easy to adopt ROAR, whereas with some other identifiers, that might not be the case. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Amanda. It's a really thorough over, overview. Um, and after uh, during this, uh, uh, this presentation, I see that a lot of uh, Q and A happening uh, as this is going on, and we have a couple of open questions. I think we will address uh, some of them. And now we have a question that have four upvotes uh, from Allison. Um, do raw identifier reflect organizational hierarchies, for example, departments? And uh, as, as do we want to address that, Amanda? Uh, are you? Are you? Uh, well, I'm sorry. Wanna... Um, I was looking. I was reading the chat questions. What did what, the Q and A questions? Did you? Right. The question is: as Roar address hierarchies within? Just Orlando. typing an answer to that, and the answer is no. Um, and that is a question that we get a lot. Um, um, you know, we heard that. If RAID gets the question a lot, what is a project? Um, ROAR gets the question a lot, are you going to um, represent departments? And the answer is essentially no. So in a way, I think of it as sort of, um, you know, number one, the, the most urgent use case that people have is for that institutional level identifier, which doesn't really exist. So I think of it at least as we need to you know, help get a really robust solution in place for that problem first before doing departments. But the truth is, is that we may never do departments because when you think of it, uh, we're as a global identifier, right? I mean, we're even just sort of identifying all of the companies and labs and facilities and research institutes and universities that are, that are touching research is a big project in and of itself. When you think about all the churn that goes on at the department level at universities worldwide, you know, I mean, departments get shut down, they get renamed, they get moved, you know, that would be a lot to handle. Um, so it's really kind of out of scope for Roar right now to handle the department level and then just, just sort of really extremely difficult. That being said, there, because Roar is entirely open and the code is entirely open and the data isn't entirely open, people can build their own departmental ontologies on top of ROAR to interoperate with it. And in fact, there is a project of um, a sort of a, a demo pilot project um, that has been done uh, to do that with the Vivo ontology that comes out of the University of uh, San, Diego, San Diego, I think, UC. Yeah, okay, that's, uh, I hope that answered your question, uh, Alison, and uh, thanks, Amanda. <laughs> with the iron clock, I want to move us on to, uh, to our uh, discussion Part. Um, there are still some open questions in Q&A, and uh, we, our panelists can still look at them. Um, so let me uh, actually share my screen here. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, we want to uh, conduct this, this discussion have, having a framework of the research lifecycle, and this is corresponding to some ongoing effort at data site that we have this um, uh, implementing fair, fair workflows project, we will address all of the uh, identifier and the metadata uh, use cases throughout the research lifecycle. So we want to um, uh, base this on the the PID optimized research lifecycle that is uh, summarized by the More Brains uh, uh, project, and uh, uh, roughly divided the the process into four stages: pre and during grant application stage, research stage, publication stage, and reporting stage. And we have our uh, guest speakers to commenting on the particular stage that they have, uh, you know, uh, targeted services based on their infrastructure. So starting with the pre and during grant application and approval stage, I would particularly like to hear from uh, Patricia from Crossref about 
uh, the fund and grant ID they have and uh, and raid uh, how they uh, or co coordinate the uh, uh, raid, raid ID. So, um, Patricia, would you want like to start? Sure, sure. Um, I'm in the middle of a really big thunderstorm, so if you hear booming, that's and 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 if I like disappear from the screen, that's what that's what's happening. It's 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 very intense. Um, yeah. So at Crossref, we maintain a funder registry where we assign identifiers and DOIs to funders. Um, the registry is updated regularly. We try to update it monthly, but it really depends. Um, currently, Elsevier's actually donated the initial data for that registry and is curating it, and then we. We do some stuff to to make it work, and uh, if the um, funder registry is completely open, it's you can download an RDF file and, and look at what funders are available. Um, in the all of the records registered with Crossref, you can provide funder information that includes the funder identifier. Um, but we also, as of a few years ago, started um, working with funders to register identifiers for grants. And those identifiers actually identify a lot of information surrounding the grant, um, like, well, who's the funding organization? Uh, what type of funding is it? How much money? Who's involved? And there's a lot of project metadata involved in that as well. Um, and those are really starting to pick up a bit. So we, we, we are hoping, you know, as we grow our funder membership and grow the number of grants registered with us, they'll become a really important part of this cycle. Well, thank you, Patricia. Mm -hmm. John? Yeah, one of the most uh, common use cases that we get, uh, and this is why I lobbied uh, uh, Jali to, to put uh, RAID in the early part of the life cycle uh, as well, is that um, say, you know, uh, multiple universities are preparing a grant uh, application um, to an external funder, they need to coordinate the information across the uh, about the underlying project that is applying for the uh, the grant across those uh, those organizations. Um, many uh, local research and uh, research information systems, Chris's, um, have the concept of a project, um, and uh, it, you know, and uh, quite a bit of uh, according to so the uh, um, it, that there's likely to be a lot of uh, double entry of data um, across organizations right now, and we're trying to uh, combat that provide a single source of truth. So you're going for an you know, you're you're putting in a grant application. Um, you know, the lead organization might um, push the information from their local uh, Chris into uh, RAID and we, we are an API for, we'll be providing a landing page uh, for each project that sort of, that we are provisionally trying to model on an ORCID landing page, uh, but it's an API first um, service uh, that they might push that information up uh, to RAID and then the other organizations that are on the grant application can then pull it down locally into their uh, in, into their systems. Um, and yeah, in, in my own, you know, experience as a researcher, the project, you know, often, um, you know, precedes the grant and uh, may exist for some time trying to get some runs on the board before a grant is uh, is even applied for. Um, so I, I think that's another one of the, the questions that come up all the time. Is what is a project? And another one, what's the difference between a project and a grant? Um, and I guess I have an easier time with that coming from a Haas discipline. Uh, we do lots of research without grants. Um, but uh, then also on the... Uh, you know, I'm an archaeologist, and the big archaeology projects I've been part of have gone on for years and have had multiple grants. So it's a sort of many to many relationships between grants and projects. And I think RAID can help sort that out, coordinate uh, across, um, even in a lot of, in, in the in in some Chris's, like the one uh, that will remain nameless that we use at, at my university. Um, it's not that there is a bit too much of an of an equation between um, uh, grants and uh, projects, and it makes some aspects of managing things it, it, that there's a lot of rekey of uh, information as you go from one grant to the next. So sort of longitudinal, longitudinally on a on, on a project as well. So um, yeah, I think those are uh, a couple of the use cases in the context of grant applications. Thank you very much, John. Um, then we move on to the next stage, which is the research research duration. And here, I think. That, uh, data site, Helena, have a lot to say. 
would you would you like me to to start um, <laughs> yes, please. yeah i think an important thing to say here and i didn't have time in my short introduction is that um, date side duis can be registered for a wide range of research outputs uh, and some of these sit really early in the research process and in the research life cycle. So for example, even before the research project start, a researcher may want to register a DOI for uh, a data management plan, a DMP ID, and also, for example, pre-register the study and assign a DOI for that. And then during the research process, before the research is completely finalized, there may already be intermediate outputs. Those can be data sets or software or workflows that can already be shared and, uh, and get a, a DOI. And then one other thing I think is important to consider when these outputs are being made available along the way is that you can continue to update the metadata and you can continue to establish those connections to all these other entities and these uh, other persistent identifiers. So this is really a process, not something that should be done once, but something that should continue over time uh, to ensure this richness of richness of connections. Uh, so yeah, maybe I'll pause there. I know there are other people that probably want to comment. Yes, I also want to kill Jens here in this stage. Uh, and I think that's the primary uh, use case for IGSN. So maybe Jens has... Yeah, um, absolutely. I, th I think that IGSN is... is um, key element in this stage of the of the life cycle where um, it allows us to identify the objects that we work with or that we produce as physical objects in the course of our research and i call them the anchor into reality where data and uh, publications are kind of abstract things they don't have a physical reality unless you print them out but who does that um, but the physical samples really have physical presence and, and in this way some properties they don't share with the other digital objects and um, but to be able to unambiguously identify what you work with is something that is crucial for reproducibility and transparency of science and and, and, and other fields of research and so I, I just in place an important role in this phase Oh, thank you, Jens. Um, with the nine on the clock, I would uh, merge the last two stages, publication and reporting stage. And I think these are both stages where ORCID and the ROAR have uh, very strong roles. So um, uh, our speak, uh, Amanda and uh, Paloma, maybe you have some uh, comments. And Paloma, would you like to go first? Yeah, I can go um, first. So actually, ORCID has a um, transversal role, I think, in all uh, in all stages. Uh, for example, um, uh, Helena was mentioning about the about the um, data management plans. In those plans, you also need to guarantee who is going to be responsible for that data, and in order to identify the uh, people responsible, then um, ORCID might be um, there playing a role. But of course, then when um, applying for a grant, um, people can identify themselves with their ORCID ID. And of course, in the part of publication or um, showing the, uh, the results and the outputs and guarantee that those outputs are connected with the corresponding contributors. And this can be done at the level of authorship, but also at the level of other type of contributorship. So, uh, for example, if someone has curated the data or if someone has um, code a particular piece of software uh, or um, if someone has review the final writing. Thank you, Paloma. Uh, Amanda? Sure, yeah. Um, one interesting thing is that I think um, a lot of the publishers who have been adopting ROAR are beginning to use that for internal reporting and including sort of compliance with OA policies. Um, we haven't seen a lot of tools yet um, built for, you know, sort of that that are that are built built on roar allowing an institution to track its own research output but that is absolutely a thing that roar is 
you know, designed to do. And we, I kind of have every confidence that those tools will continue to be built. I actually think that um, data site commons is a, is a really good example of the kinds of things you can do with the RAR ID and the kinds of institutional browse you can uh, get. Because if you go to data site commons and begin to look, uh, to, to look at sort of works by institution that that data site commons enables, you'll see the kind of thing that war can help do. It's just that not a lot of that has been adopted in kind of public um, interfaces yet, public tools yet. But it's certainly one of the things, um, Crossref did a survey, um, I think um, in a couple of years ago, in which they asked their own members, which are mostly publishers, uh, what one thing they wanted and that was one of the key things uh, was um, the ability to sort of find their own work by institution so right thank you amanda um so i noticed that we have a good question in the q a that is still open uh, that is specifically addressed to sean about their uh, about raid um he said uh, raid uh could be used between project partners to share information as well as Preparing grant application, how open would the rate landing page be? Surely people won't want information relating to a grant application be open before a grant has been allowed? Uh, <laughs> the, there has been heated discussion about this internally at the you know at the ARDC and about uh, uh, no it, it's it's been quite uh, productive um it, you know uh, we are looking at the orchid model of um sort of um what is it uh, open uh, trusted entities uh, private sort of it, it's a bit more complicated because of uh, because a project will have mul uh, will often not always have multiple um, uh, participants or contributors um, at minimum in uh, in the you know sort of version uh, you know uh, the next version of the um, service that's out where we're going to look at doing embargo periods and open closed um, you know as as a first you know, as a first step, and then uh, do a bit more requirements gathering on, um, you know, on on what level of what additional level of nuance in open and close. Like, is there some, is there ever a use case where some metadata might be open and other metadata might be closed, or is it really just an all or nothing um, thing? Uh, we we want to we recognize. Um, uh, these use cases, uh, like uh, the one here, like well, we want to keep the project um, under wraps until the grants won. We also recognize uh, a use case that was brought to uh, brought to us in in, in um, some of our conversations about in, uh, industry funded research that sometimes a, a university has to sign an NDA, a non disclosure agreement, to make you know, to, and say they can't they can't tell people about the research usually for a period of time. And so we're looking at an embargo uh, period as the sort of first 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 stop uh, on this and if we need more nuance than that we're, we're um I, bring, bring me use cases and I'll try to uh, see what the the simplest solution is uh, to them thank you Ron. Uh, thank you Sean uh, and uh, uh, anonymous question asker I uh, think uh, hope that answers your question and the uh, last yes you have your hands up yeah, I just wanted to, to add to what Sean just said that in the in a report a couple of years ago, the Royal Society uh, published this report, Science is an Open Enterprise, and they, I think, put it quite nicely, this principle of intelligent openness to be as open as possible and as closed as necessary. And Sean touched on a couple of uh, use cases, but there are others as well that not just confidentiality, but there's also cultural norms, vulnerable subjects or vulnerable objects that need to be protected that where you cannot put that better information online. So there's a lot of legitimate reasons where we have to consider intelligent openness and provide means of controlling what is released to the public and what isn't. And it, also when you cross-link so that you can't deduct, deduce um, hidden information from implicitly deducing that it from the knowledge graph. Yeah, sorry, I'll just very briefly I'll, I'll follow up that we we're hoping. I mean, we do 
want this information to be as open as possible, but we also recognize the as closed as necessary. We're optimistic, I'd say, at the beginning, in the sense that in speaking to one of the you know, operators of, of uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, data repositories in Australia, the Australian Data Archive that does social science data, um, that most of their data data sets are sensitive, but in almost all cases, they can make the metadata about the data set. Avail and since we're only dealing in metadata, we're, we're sort of cautiously optimistic that that most of the time it will be able to make this metadata uh, uh, available. And because we do track sort of the history of the project, like everything we we uh, have sort of start and end dates to all the contributors and organizations and stuff that it does make a nice encapsulation of the history of a project that could be port important metadata for uh, outputs of uh, metadata paradata about uh, outputs. So, right. I hope that uh, make people feel happier and safer with uh, with all of this uh, metadata uh, identifier metadata. So with that. Uh, we are going to conclude the session and thank you for all of the panelists and uh, thank you for all of the attendees for joining us today. And I just want to say that you are, you are seeing that data side is working closely together with all of our system organizations to address all of these use cases. And uh, you can be only grow more strong and more robust with your our members continuous support and pouring your metadata into this graph of, uh, of um, uh, identifier infrastructures. So please uh, remember to not uh, like uh, uh, get to, to share uh, ac accurate and rich metadata. And uh, if that uh, like a takeaway message for you, and uh, that's where I'm going to uh, wrap up and uh, let's uh, make a pitter place uh, together. That's a call out to last, last year's session if you were there. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. I'm going to close this now so we can start the next session. So thanks. It was great. Thank you. Bye.